Not all crimes, intrigues, and murder were committed in London. When Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said some of his stories in the outlying regions of England, with its Grimpin Myers, its ghost-like castles, and areas of miscovered marshlands, the stories took on an added dimension. And so it is with Green and Boucher's cunningly crafted The Headless Monk. Things are not quite what they seem. Or are they? Conflict is truly the basis of dramatic tension, and this episode is filled with it. Although the story unfolds in a linear fashion, suspicion and conflict continue to grow as character after character becomes suspect after suspect in this strange case. A question here is whether the supernatural, and specifically supernatural evil, exists. Mortimer Harley, the well-known expert in spiritual phenomena, asked Holmes and Watson to accompany him on a case. There is a great respect between Holmes and Harley for each other's work, for both men use deductive logic and scientific methods to evaluate evidence and to reach their conclusions. Yet Harley builds his belief on faith, while Holmes builds them on logic. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who in the latter years of his life was a staunch advocate of spiritualism, always used logical methods in his attempts to prove that ghosts, spirits, and phenomena did exist. He was a realist who wanted deeply to establish that there was, indeed, a spiritual world. This is not unlike the approach of Mortimer Harley, or for that matter, Sherlock Holmes, who in his attempts actually wants to do the opposite, that is, prove that ghosts do not exist. I suspect that Anthony Boucher, an expert on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as well as Sherlock Holmes, created the plot of the story so that he and Dennis Green could, through this radio drama, reveal the kinds of conflict that exist between those who believe in logic and those who take things on faith. Now, in the end, it is faith that is the undoing of Mortimer Harley, and it is logic that brings Holmes to a successful conclusion of the case. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in The Headless Monk. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to tell you the easiest way I know to get the reputation of being the perfect host. Next time friends come over for dinner, before you sit down to the table, serve glasses of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. I say Petri Sherry because Petri Sherry is extraordinary Sherry. You can tell by looking at it. Hold it to the light. Notice how clear it is. Notice its beautiful deep amber color. And you can tell Petri Sherry is unusual from just a whiff of its fragrance. And, of course, in the last analysis, you can tell just how fine a wine Petri Sherry is by tasting it. That's the best test of all. And that's where you'll get the most pleasant surprise because Petri Sherry really tastes wonderful. A flavor right from the heart of the grape. So serve Petri Sherry to your family and your friends and serve it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's not keep him waiting. Come in, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You'll forgive me if I, I don't get up, won't you, my boy? Of course, Doctor. What's the matter, a touch of rheumatism? No, no, I've played 18 holes of golf today. <laughs> I hope that when I'm your age, Doctor, I can be half as sprightly. Oh, it's nice of you, but if you don't mind, we won't discuss the uh, question of my age. <laughs> so drop your chair, make yourself comfortable, and... I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, from the hint you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a spooky story. It was, Mr. Bartell. It, it certainly was. Towards the end of November in the year 1895, a dense yellow fog had settled down over London. For four or five days, it was impossible from our rooms in Baker Street 
to see the outline of the houses up there. A real London pea super, huh, Doctor? Yes, my boy, and it became most depressing. The first day Holmes had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of criminal references. The second and third had been patiently occupied with a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day, on pushing back our chairs after breakfast, we saw the greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes, Sherlock Holmes' impatient and active nature could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting room, chafing against the inaction. After several minutes of these perambulations, he turned to me and spoke. Anything of interest in the paper, Watson? news of a revolution, a possible war, and of an impending change in the government. Nothing to interest you, though. <laughs> no crimes of any importance. The London criminal is certainly a dull and unenterprising fellow these days. Look out of the window, Watson. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the foggy depths. What a day for a thief or a murderer. He could roam London as the tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces, and then... Evident only to his victim. Well, that's a cheerful thought, I must say. Hello, hello. I wonder who that is. Probably a visitor for Mrs. Hudson, or perhaps the local plumber has finally condescended to pay some attention to the faulty gas jet in our hallway. I don't think you're right on either count. I can hear Mrs. Hudson's footsteps on the stairs. Come in. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but there's a gentleman to see you. Says it's most important, and he asked me to give you this card. Oh, thank sir. you. Oh, Mortimer Harley, eh? Show him up, please, Mrs. Hudson. Very good. Mortimer Harley, and who's he? I've not had the pleasure of meeting him personally, but I'm quite familiar with his scientific reputation. Scientific? Oh, and what does he specialize? Oh, I, uh, I suppose one might refer to him as one of the greatest authorities on all matters connected with the occult. You mean the fellow dabbles in supernatural stuff and all that sort of thing? Hmm. I mean, my dear Watson, that uh, Mortimer Harley is an extremely intelligent man with a thoroughly comprehensive and scholarly knowledge of his field and an intense belief in the existence of the supernatural force. Now, here he is to speak for himself. Oh, come in, Harley. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, you're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Harley? How do you do, Doctor? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Thank you. <laughs> well, you fellows are probably wondering who I am and... What's brought me here? Well, we're not wondering who you are, Mr. Harley. My friend Holmes was just telling me of your scientific eminence. I'm flattered that you know of me, Holmes. Just the same, you're wondering why I'm here. Naturally, sir. Well, since you know I'm a student of the occult, I'll get right down to my problem. Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the headless monk of Trevenis Chapel? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Harley. An apparition to be counted among our more intangible national treasures, I should say. I'm sorry to appear stupid, but I have never heard of the headless monk or whatever it is, Chapel. Well, then, let me tell you about it, Doctor. Yes, I wish you would. The Venice Manor in Cornwall was once an abbey. It was expropriated during the reign of Henry VIII, and several of the monks were killed in some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the minor difficulties attendant on such an act. But one of the murdered monks, a certain Brother Hugh, the chapel organist, was persistent. He still haunts the chapel today. He still plays the organ. And since he was beheaded, he always appears headless. <laughs> Charming little legend, Mr. Harley, but you can't expect us to believe it's anything but a legend, surely. Ah, skeptic, eh? How about you, Mr. Holmes? I'm extremely curious to know why you've come to see me, Mr. Harley. I'll tell you why. I have a rare opportunity to investigate the phenomena. You see... The son of an old friend of mine, a young fellow by the name of Leonard Miles, is secretary to the owner of Trevenis Manor. He asked me to stay there, and I find the invitation irresistible, particularly since the phenomena have curiously increased of late, Mr. Holmes, almost as though some more mortal agency were motivating them. Oh. Now I see why you've come to me, Mr. Harley. I knew you would, Holmes. You see, I'm like my good friend and fellow investigator, Carnacki. I believe in being prepared to meet phenomena on either the natural or the supernatural plane. If the phenomena are real, then they fall legitimately in my field. Uh, whereas if, um, as I'm sure you suspect, they are being contrived by human forces, then you think uh, that's more in my department, eh, Holly? Exactly. Well, what do you say, Holmes? A little trip to Cornwall would be a nice few, few days. We, we'd probably escape the fog down there. Ah, oh, the places with the weather, Watson. What? Huh? I'm much more concerned with the fog that surrounds the appearances of the headless monk of Trevenice Chapel. And Mr. Harley, 
I accept your invitation with pleasure. There's still time to catch the Cornish Express. We can be at Trevenice Manor before the moon is up. this funny-looking fellow coming down the steps towards us. If I didn't hear the sound of his footsteps, I'd believe it was a psychic manifestation. He certainly looks as if he came from beyond the grave. Who be ye, gentlemen? Where be ye going? Well, supposing you tell us who you are first, my good man. Who be I? I be David Bendragon, sir. That's who I be. Stable and here at the manor. And I ask you gentlemen again where you be going. We're staying at the manor, and we're just going to take a look at the chapel. Oh, don't he do that, sir. People that go in there don't often come out the way they go in, sir. Don't he do it, gentlemen? What are you talking about, my good fellow? I be talking about the ghoulies and the ghosties and the organ music that comes out of the nowhere. You... you heard it? Of course I heard it, sir. Just like I seen the poor monk walking around without his head on. Take us into the chapel, will you? And, and show us where you saw the figure? Aye, that I will not, sir. Not for all the gold in Port Call will I go back and chance seeing the poor lost soul wandering about without his head on. You gentlemen know what's good for you. You'll not go in there either. Mark my words. Don't he go in that chapel. Extraordinary chap. Seems really frightened of the place. Yes, but it's more than blind superstition that accounts for his reluctance. Uh, let's go in, shall we? Well, I suppose it's all right. Great Scott. Listen to that. The organ. The ghost's playing. We're extremely fortunate. A psychic manifestation as soon as we enter. Remarkable. Psychic manifestation. Rubbish. Look who's sitting at the keyboard. It's Holmes. Holmes. What's the matter, Watson? What's the matter? <laughs> you frightened us to death, didn't he, Holly? Well, speaking for myself, Doctor, he disappointed me. I thought it was a genuine phenomenon. What do you think you're doing, Holmes? I thought you were still behind us. I'm sorry if I frightened you, Watson. I was curious about this organ. I slipped in by the side door ahead of you and tested the instrument. It's in astonishingly good condition for a disused chapel, don't you think, Harley? Yes, I do, Holmes. One might reasonably presume that someone tends it with great care. In fact, I would go further Who and are say... You? What are you doing in here? Uh, we are guests at the manor house and we decided to pay a visit to the chapel before we paid our respects to our host. Oh, my father is your host. I'm Dorothy Brown. How do you do, Dorothy? Uh, my, my name is uh, Holmes, and these gentlemen are Dr. Watson and uh, Mr. Harley. How, How do you do, do Dr. Dr. Watson, Harley? Mr. Harley? I heard the organ music, and I was terribly frightened. You've heard of the legend, I suppose. You mean about the headless monk and the ghostly organ music, Miss Brownlee? Yes, Doctor. And it's more than a legend, I assure you. That's why I rushed over here as soon as I heard it. It must have frightened all the servants within hearing distance. Why were you playing the organ? I was curious to see whether it was in good repair. Obviously it is, Mr. Holmes. Well, my father and his secretary, Mr. Miles, are expecting you, I know. Let's walk over to the house, shall we? I'm sure you've seen enough of the chapel for tonight. Father, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, sir? How do you do? This is my secretary, Leonard Miles. How do you do, Mr. Miles? Oh, Mr. Miles, well. Dr. Watson? I'm afraid Mr. Brown is rather angry with me. I hadn't told him that you were an expert on psychic phenomena, Mr. Harley. Well, I fail to see why the knowledge of that fact would make you angry, Mr. Brownley. I don't want you ferreting about into this so-called ghost business. There's been enough trouble in the neighborhood already. It's almost impossible to keep servants... And these Cornish people are incredibly superstitious. You haven't seen the ghost yourself, Mr. Brownlee? Oh, of course not. There isn't any ghost, I tell you. You heard the mysterious organ playing? Hmm? Uh, well, uh, no, no, I haven't. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yes, yes, what is it? David Pendragon's at the door. He's very anxious to see you, sir. Pendragon? Oh, oh very well. Tell him to come in. Uh, yes, sir. David? What does he want, I wonder? Pendragon, uh, that's the fellow we met outside the chapel, isn't it? Yes. Quite a colourful character. Oh, he's a superstitious old fool, if you ask me. But he is a good groom. Yes, Pendragon, what is it? Begging your pardon, sir, but there'll be trouble at the chapel again tonight. I says to myself, David, tis your duty to go to the master, I oh, says. Oh, never mind, never mind. What's the trouble? As the moon was hanging low tonight, sir, 
Oh, here's the organ a playing. But that was Mr. Holmes, my good man. Aye, that's what he thinks, maybe. But what I says to myself is, what made him play the organ? Then this very night, I saw the headless monk. With my own eyes, I saw that poor soul with his head off, wandering in the moonlight. I saw that, sir, with my own eyes, I did. Oh, get out of here, you blithering old fool. And I'm warning you, if I hear any more nonsense about this ghost, you'll lose your job, you understand? Now come along, be off with you. Aye, sir, begging your pardon, sir. Come on, I'll give you chaps a drink. Mr. Brown seems absolutely rabid on the subject of the ghost, eh? Yes, suspiciously so. What about he's trying to hide? Whatever it is, I don't think he'll be successful. In your profession, Holmes, you know that murder will out. It's true in my profession also. Try to suppress them as you may, gentlemen. Ghosts will out. This place may be haunted, but I swear that I never spent a better night anywhere. Ah, good morning, Mr. Holly. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm glad to see I'm not the only late riser. Oh, were you up late too, sir? Yes, I was, Doctor. I decided to ignore the veiled threats of Mr. Brownlee, and so I did a little investigating in the chapel. Uh, do you mind passing the teapot? And what were the results of your investigations, Mr. Holly? Well, there was no psychic manifestation, you understand, but I'm sure of one thing. That chapel is evil. Evil to the hearts of its stones. And I'll swear that evil does not stem from the hapless monk who was murdered there. Mm, you confirm certain suspicions aroused by my own investigations last night. There is evil here, Mr. Harley, and I think I know its nature. Unless I mistake every sign and reaction, someone has been initiating the local peasantry into the evils of the Black Mass. Black Mass? Good Lord, what a, what a shocking thought. My own sensations last night confirm your theory, Holmes. There is a coven here, I swear it, hiding its own obscene practices under cover of the haunting. Well, that sounds quite feasible. After all, the people are so superstitious that they'd keep her as far away as possible from the chapel when they, when they heard the organ playing. Well, this problem falls into both our fields, Harley. The practice of black magic is a criminal offence. Well, perhaps it's just as well the old laws against witchcraft are still in force. I imagine, Mr. Harley, that you... Uh... Have your own methods of combating such forces as we're up against? Oh, yes, Holmes. Though mine are not connected with the legal aspect of the case. Of May I ask what you plan to do, sir? Well, I have several rather elaborate preparations to make, Doctor. It'll take me most of the day, I'm afraid. However, I shall explain them to you all uh, after dinner tonight. <laughs> It's very pleasant to sit here after a good dinner with a superb brandy at one's elbow <laughs> and listen to the piano being so, so charmingly played. You're very fine, darling. Want to play something more, Miss Brownlee? I'd love to. Are you enjoying your stay down here, Oh, Mr. very Holmes? much, thank you. Both Mr. Harley and I have found the local folklore extremely interesting. I see. You fellows haven't been investigating the haunted chapel business again, have you? Oh, look here. If you have, I shall be very angry. It's abusing my hospitality. I told you distinctly I didn't want any more talk of ghosts. We are not talking of ghosts, my dear Mr. Brownlee. I have something even more important that I must fight now. It's possibly a little hard to imagine me as a crusader. Me, the stooped little man beside the four of you, as toweringly tall a quartet of men as I have ever faced. And yet, I am your St. George. What on earth are you talking about, sir? I'll tell you in secrecy. This mustn't reach the ears of the peasantry. I refer to myself as St. George because I go to wipe out an evil that lives in your midst, a living modern dragon. Oh, please, Mr. Harley. That sounds dreadfully frightening. And to rid you all of this fiend, I must cleanse the chapel, purify it, exercise it, remove its residue of psychic evil. That, gentlemen, is my mission tonight. <laughs> Dorothy! Fainted. Get some smelling salts quickly. I'm afraid you were a little too graphic, Mr. Harley. I'm sorry if I frightened the young lady, but I, I'm i sure that after tonight she will have no further grounds for fear in Trevenis Manor. <laughs> Nothing but the owls and the clock striking midnight. 
I'm getting off the jumper. What do you suppose Harley's up to? I can imagine his procedure. Midnight. A crucial hour, I suppose, in his endeavors. I wish him luck. My own plans are not nearly as clear, unfortunately. I sense a guiding force here, but I lack the clues. There is something, Harley's. Listen! Great heavens! It's the organ in the chapel. And Harley's in there alone. Not alone. Listen to the organ. Peeling talk, it's madness. Come on, Watson. Something has gone horribly wrong. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. You know, a moment ago, I told you how much I thought you'd like Petri California Sherry, but I didn't tell you that Petri Sherry is the all-round, all-American wine. You can not only serve Petri Sherry before dinner, it's good after dinner, too. And, of course, later in the evening when you're listening to the radio with some friends, a glass of Petri Sherry is just the thing. And, say, Petri makes two kinds of sherry, the regular and Petri Pale Dry. To make sure you get the one that you like best, do what I do. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri. Dr. Watson, that was a heck of a place to break off your story. Then let us continue it as speedily as possible, my boy. As soon as we heard that devilish organ music, Holmes and I rushed out of the house and raced in the moonlight down the path leading to the ruined chapel. By the time we reached the entrance, the organ music had ceased, and the tall, gangling figure of David Pendragon was standing in our path. You gentlemen be wanting at this Never time of night. Right. What are you doing here? Oi, I be here because the gentleman gave me five shillings to stand outside here and see that no one disturbed him. Uh, That's why I be here. And nobody did come or go. He still be there, he be. But when you heard that organ music, why the devil didn't you go in? Organ music? I heard no organ oh, music, come on, sir. Watson. Great heavens. Look at him. We're too late, poor devil. A knife through his heart. It's obvious who did it at Fuller Pendragon. I'll, I'll go and grab him no, before no, he gets no, away. Watson, he's not our man. This murder was planned with devilish cunning. The curious thing, there's no sign of a struggle at all. Looks like he just stood here and allowed himself to be stabbed. Is there these uh, chalk marks with which the body is surrounded? They're known as a pentagram, I believe. He thought it would protect him completely from the supernatural forces. Poor chap. For once his researches went too far. Yes, because they touched not on the supernatural, but upon natural evil. And remember, Watson, that only three people besides ourselves and David Pendragon... Knew of this vigil. Yes, Brownlee, his daughter, and young Miles, the secretary. Exactly. Um, go back to the house, will you? And bring them here. Perhaps we can lay a ghost by trapping a murderer. And that's all I know, Mr. Holmes. Well, you've not established much so far, Holmes. Three of them all swear they were asleep and that they didn't hear the organ. Yes, then you can't prove otherwise. I think I can prove that one of you was not only awake, but also murdered Mortimer Harley. But why should any of us want the poor man dead, Mr. Holmes? In your case, young lady, I confess that I find it hard to conceive a motive. Implying that Mr. Brownlee and I might have one. Well, Mr. Miles, you must admit that you're responsible for Mr. Harley coming here. And you, Mr. Brownlee, must uh, admit that you did everything in your power to prevent the dead man from carrying out his investigations. Why? What are you trying to hide? Nothing. It's just that I wanted to sell the manor house. All this talk about ghosts was giving the place a bad name. And if it had gone on, I'd never have disposed of the property. Well, speculation can get us nowhere. Let's get down to facts. Is there any other entrance to this chapel besides the two doors? None. Well, there was an old smuggler's cave which came out near the organ lot, but Father had it bricked up some years ago. I had to. The tourists kept crawling in. Go and examine it, will you, Watson, old chap? All right, your house. If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, it seems obvious who did this murder. You told us David Pendragon admitted that no one went in or out as he stood guard. He must have done it himself. Oh, the man's half-witted. And superstitious. He might have killed Mr. Harley because he was attempting to interfere with a ghost. And then played the organ to celebrate the occasion? I think you overestimate David Pendragon's capabilities, Miss Brownlee. Mr. Miles. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Pendragon is waiting outside. Would you be kind enough to ask him to come here for a moment, please? Certainly, uh, what did you find out, Watson? Well, it's easy to see where it was bricked up, but it's a solid wall now. No one could get in that way. But if no one came in or out, who else could have killed Harley except Pendragon? The ghost, or rather the person disguised as a ghost. The dead man expected a psychic manifestation. When he, uh, when he saw the supposed ghost, 
Coming towards him, he offered no resistance. He believed that the magical pentagram would protect him. Ah, there you are, David. Oi, here I be, sir. But I don't know nothing more than what I told thee. No, don't be frightened, Pendragon. All we want is the truth. That's what I told thee, sir. And tell us a little more, will you? Uh, when you said no one had entered the chapel tonight, you meant that no mortal man had entered, didn't you? That I did, sir. But how could I say I'd seen the ghost when Mr. Brownlee here had told me I'd lose my job if I spoke of the ghost again? Oh, now we're getting some up. So you did see the ghost? That I did, sir. The poor soul walking through the moonlight with no head on his body. You saw it quite clearly? Just as clearly as I sees you now, sir. How tall was he? He was... Would you, would you mind standing against the wall, sir? Yes, of course. He was as tall as... Well, his shoulders come to just where your shoulders come now, sir. You're a tall man, then, so we narrow it down to either you, Mr. Brownlee, or you, Mr. Oh, Miles. this is utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. On the contrary, gentlemen, the case is solved. Which one of them was it, Holmes? Neither. Remember that the ghost is headless. That means that the imposter must have built up fake shoulders covering the head. On either of these men, it would have uh, brought their shoulders to the level of my head. Great Scott, it was... <laughs> Bravo, Mr. Holmes. I didn't think you'd catch me. Dorothy! No, no, I don't believe... Just down me, I must warn you that... Keep back! Do any of you come near me? As you see, I have a revolver. Dorothy, for heaven's sake! Don't speak to me of heaven! <laughs> you thought I was a sweet little girl, didn't you, Father? <laughs> You didn't know your dear, demure daughter could murder a man, did you? Why did you kill Mortimer Harley? Because he was a meddler. For months I've been practicing black magic here. For months I've been building up the legend of the headless monk and the organ music. It made me so wonderfully alone. So gloriously free to practice the rite. And then he came here. I let him live that first night because I thought he was a fool. But on the second, when he said he was going to exercise this chapel, to purify this, he said. He signed his death warrant. <laughs> if you could have seen his face, if you could only have seen his stupid, toddled face as I plunged the knife into him. Dorothy! He bled so beautifully. Holmes, Holmes, she's mad as a hatter. What are we going to do? Barney, give me that revolver. And let you take me to prison or to asylum. No, you'll never catch me. She's backing up the stairs leading to the organ loft. Dorothy, Dorothy, come back. Don't try and follow Look me. out. The railing's behind you. Oh, and turn my head. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I... No! No! Dorothy. Dorothy. My poor little girl. Mr. Brownlee, the powers of evil are frightening. Your daughter had killed one man and might have killed more. She was insane. Hopelessly insane. Well, Doctor, that was quite an exciting story. You know, I wish I could play the organ and write music for it. There's nothing like music to really express a thought. Yes, I can just imagine the kind of music that you'd write. Probably catchy little ditties such as The Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you drink, remember Petri wine. Oh, no, Doctor. Is that the way I affect you? Although on the level, you could probably write beautiful music to describe the way the grapes look on the vine in the sunlight. But what music could tell you about the Petri family? and How long they've been making fine wine? You know, the Petri family has been making wine for generations, handing on down from father to son, from father to son, the knowledge necessary to transform luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. And when you see that name Petri on a bottle of wine, remember, you're not looking at a mere trademark. That name Petri is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle meets their unusually high standards. Petri wine is always good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me think. Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that started quietly enough as Holmes and I sat at a London dinner party, and yet, before the evening was over, we found ourselves involved in one of the most shocking scandals that ever rocked London society.
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Were you surprised as I was that the headless monk turned out to be Dorothy Brownlee? Green and Boucher cleverly contrived the story so that she was the least suspected of those who might have killed Mortimer Holly. To me, this made the revelation of her being the murderess all the more unexpected. <laughs> The two episodes you have just heard, The Demon Barber and The Headless Monk, are part of the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and are a 1988 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. This is Ben Wright. I hope you'll join me sometime soon again for more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.